Amen. You may be seated. And um, I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. And, um, and then we're going to spend this afternoon in Luke chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 2. Hay un reson resonancia que se oye. Um, Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. And um, I want to, as you're making your way to Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, I want to take this moment to welcome and thank those that are joining us um, through social media, through Alleluia TV, through Radio Alleluia. Um, we pray and, and um, believe that um, there, wherever you find yourself, that today's message will be a blessing for you, as we believe that it's going to be a blessing for us here in-house. Can somebody support with an amen? Amen. amen like that. I'll tell you, man, I said that at 8 a.m., and they're like, amen. You know, and I say that at 10 a.m., I'm like, amen. And then I'm like, no, 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 man, you're not encouraging the people that listen and live or watch live to, to want to come. Like, no, we, we got it. We got it, like, with energy, right, with energy. But I understand, you know, it's cold. Y'all didn't drink your abuelita chocolate, you know, you, you didn't get your cafe, I understand, you know, but come on, man, we, we need to do that part with energy, right, with energy. Um, well, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, uh, the, my greatest desire and the desire of my family is that you and your loved ones would be able to spend this time together with, um, in unity, with health, and um, we bless you, we, we wish the best for all of you as we prepare to finish out this year and to enter into a new year. Um, this week, and I think we have two more weekends left, I'm going to be teaching over Christmas. What is Christmas really about? And this is my message today is what is Christmas about? What is the birth of, the, of, this, of this baby there in Bethlehem? Uh, uh, what is this about? And let me tell you that Christmas is, is really important. The, the birth of Jesus is important. Our salvation is based on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is based on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But if it were not for the virgin birth of Jesus, right, uh, born by the, uh, uh, by the Virgin Mary, uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, if it were not for this miraculous birth, right, a, a virgin given birth, if it were not for this prophetic birth, so much prophetic word given about the birth of Jesus, then there would, no, there would be no resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the birth of Jesus and an understanding of the birth of Jesus is important. I mean, if it were not important, uh, we wouldn't be talking about it 2,000 years later. Right? Here we are 2,000 years after the birth of Jesus, still teaching, preaching, and talking, celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. And it shows its, its, its importance. If not, it would have just disappeared. It would have just faded away, you know. And, and, um, and so it's important that we would have a good understanding of what, what this birth means. Uh, let's go to Luke. And uh, as you wait for me in Luke chapter 1, I'll tell you that Luke is, is, I would say, perhaps my favorite gospel. Sometimes it's Mark. Sometimes it's Luke. Sometimes it's John. But, you know, anyway, it's like my daughters, right? I tell them all they're my favorite, you know, when, when the others are not around. But one of the things I like about Luke, or some of the things I like about Luke, is that first of all, Luke was written by a Gentile for Gentiles, right? Um, for, the, for the Jewish people, there's two groups of people. There's the Jews and then everybody else. Everybody else is a Gentile. Doesn't matter if you're Mexican, doesn't matter if you're Texan, doesn't matter if you're African, you're from Asia. Um, they, they just see everybody else as Gentiles. And um, when we read the Gospel of Luke, Luke was written, he was himself a, a Gentile. So we don't see a lot of like um, traditions and stuff like that from the Old Testament. He's just telling us what, what happened and what people saw um, so that we could have a better understanding of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the things I like about the Gospel of Luke is that if you read the Gospel of Luke and then you go into, the into Acts, um, Acts is like part two. Luke is like part one, Acts is like part two. So if you read Luke and you read Acts, you have a good firm foundation of our faith and, and how everything got started. So take time, read Luke, read Acts. Um, today is um, the 10th. And so a um, uh, cool little thing for you to do is, is maybe um, today open up the Gospel of Luke and read up to chapter 10. And then tomorrow the 11th, read chapter 11. And then Tuesday the 12th, read chapter 12. And so on. And uh, by the time we get to the 24th, you will be concluding, finishing, reading the Gospel of Luke, ready to celebrate Christmas with the Gospel of, of Jesus Christ written by Luke fresh in your mind. And there's 24 chapters. So that's a pretty cool thing to do on, on December is to read a chapter a day. And 10 chapters you can easily catch up. You can read five today, six tomorrow. You can read all 10 today and then start off on the 11th tomorrow. And so I want to highly encourage you to do that. Let us read Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Let me get some water here. 
Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. I like this. So Luke is writing his gospel while people who were eyewitnesses, people who, who were there when things happened, they were still alive. So this is to assure us that this isn't mythology. Right? I don't know how many of you in, in, in uh, elementary or middle school, you studied Greek and Roman mythology. This is not mythology. Right? This is not a novel. This is not a legend. Right? This is not a, a Mickey Mouse, fair, uh, Mickey Mouse uh, Disney World, uh, Disneyland fairy tale. Right? He's like, look, I went and, I, and I'm going to give you an account of the events that happened that were been fulfilled among us. This happened amongst us, the believers. Verse 2 says, they used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. That means the people that were there from the very beginning, they were eyewitnesses to everything that happened. And he's like, I got the report. I did the investigation. I went and met up with them. Eyewitnesses, right? Here in, Ch in Houston, we have a famous uh, award-winning news organization on Channel 13. Uh, what, is, what is that uh, news organization called on Channel 13? Anybody know? Eyewitness news, right? It's not I heard news. It's not my baby mama told my cousin, you know, like, no, 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 no. It's eyewitness news, right? You go to court, what is the only type of testimony that's valid? It is an eyewitness account. That's what the judge doesn't want to hear about. I heard, you know, my, my cousin told my uncle, and then my uncle told my mom, you know, because they like to gossip, and then my mom told my sister, and my sister told me, right? Like, like no, no. It says eyewitness, right? And this is what Luke is saying. He's like, look, what I'm going to present to you is the eyewitness account. I've gone and investigated from the people that were there from the very beginning. Verse 3 says, have been carefully, notice the word, investigated everything from the beginning. I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus. When I read this, I like to sometimes take Theophilus out and put my own name because uh, it's the only time somebody calls me most honorable, right? So most honorable Reuben. And it says, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Let me tell you something about Luke. Luke was a doctor, right? He was a physician. And a good doctor is a good investigator, all right? A good doctor is a good investigator. I often share this as years ago, this, this, I have bad allergies. And so this crazy weather that we have in Texas, oh man, it's horrible. When it's nice and you're like, oh, it's such a nice day, just know Pastor Ruben's suffering. You know, like, I mean, that's, that's my life. And um, years ago, I had this cough and it was, man, I just could not shake this cough. And it just, it just lingered and lingered and lingered for months. I had this cough. And so I was taking allergy medicine. I was trying them all, Claritin, Allegra, Zyrtec, you know, the ones with Ds, the ones without Ds, I mean, all of them. Uh, somebody told me, oh, take this, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's like the natural stuff, uh, pa Patheo, um, anybody know? I've, anyways, take this like, supposedly like a natural thing or whatever, okay. Um, I was taking Robotussin, like, like there's no tomorrow. Um, cough drops, man, I'm like, like every, 10 minutes, I'm popping a cough drop, and man, this cough's horrible, and I'm like at church preaching, and uh, <coughs> you know, like and a friend of mine, he, he, he's gone to be with the Lord, he was like, Pastor, when you preach and you have to cough, turn the mic so it doesn't sound so horrible on radio. I'm like, okay, so I'm like practicing my technique of turning the mic around. My mom's like, mijo, ya ve con el doctor, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this elder lady from our church is like, you know, Pastor, you had that cough for months. You better go see a doctor. And I don't know why, you know, I was like, ah, my mom told me, now the anciana from church told me I better go. So I go to the doctor. I tell the doctor, I've had this cough for, for several months. I'm taking allergy medicines. I've taken Robitussin. I'm taking cough drops. And it, nothing's helping me. As a matter of fact, I feel like it's making me worse. So my doctor asks, he goes, do you cough more in the day or at night? I'm like, what? I go, I have a cough. I'm coughing all the time. He goes, yeah, but do you cough more in the day or at night? I'm like, I don't know. Go, at night, I suppose. And he goes, okay, do you cough more when you're standing up and sitting down or when you lay down? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not paying attention. Like, I'm just coughing. He goes, yeah, yeah, but listen, do you cough more when you're, when you're upright 
or when you lay down. And I thought about it and I go, well, I think I cough more when I lay down. And he goes, okay, you have acid reflux. He goes, go to CVS, take this, you know, uh, you know over the counter, uh, I forgot what he recommended. And he goes, in two weeks, you'll be fine. You know what? Two weeks, man, it was gone. Okay. That, that, that's a good doctor. He, he didn't just, you know, it, like me, I would be a horrible doctor. Right? I mean, it would be a horrible. Like, you come in and you'd be like, you know, doctor, my elbow hurts. I would be like, does it hurt when you do this? Yes. Okay, don't do that. No more. Like that. I mean, there, there we go. Like, <laughs> case solved. Right? You know, I mean, that, that's the type of doctor I would be. And so, $5 for that consultation. Right? You know, next. Right? And, you know, like, no, a good physician is a good investigator. And this is what Luke, Luke is. Luke is like investigating. He didn't just write this because he talked to one person. He talked to everybody that he could that was an eyewitness. He got first hand account because he wanted to give us, notice verse 3, an accurate account. Right. An accurate account. Verse 4. So you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. And th this, is, this is my goal every time that I'm preaching and teaching, every time that we open these doors and people are coming to church and we do discipleship class and, and other classes, every time somebody comes here to receive the word, this is, this is like, like, like the epitome of what I'm trying to do is that you would leave here certain of the truth. Certain of the truth of everything you were taught. And I'm going to tell you, uh, th this is a little bit of what we call exhortation. I'm not, no, no los estoy regañando. I'm, I'm not getting after you. I'm just, I'm just going to share a truth with you. Is that we live in a day and age, especially here in America, where we have access to more Bibles than any other time in the history of the world. We have access to more sound doctrine in books, in teachings, in preachings, YouTube, internet, books, articles, magazines, than any time in the history of the world. And yet we are more Bible illiterate than perhaps any other time in the history of the world. We know less about the Bible. With all of these resources, we know less about, we, we know the average person in the average church knows very little about the Bible. If I was to say, let's go to St. Reuben chapter two, I'll be there in a minute. Men would finish service and they still would be looking for St. Reuben chapter two. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist. It's not in the Bible. Luke writes these things that we will be certain in what we believe. Right? Let's go to chapter two. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Now, at this time, Rome pretty much rules the world, all right? There were sayings that said, like, the sun never sets on Rome. That means wherever the sun was, Rome rules. There were other sayings that said, all roads lead to Rome, because they just kept conquering, and then they would start commerce, right, with the countries they were conquering. And so they needed roads to go back and forth, send soldiers back and forth, commerce back and forth, spices and gold and silver back and forth. Verse 2 says, this was the first census taken while Cernius was governor of Syria. Three, all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census, right? We do a census here in America every 10 years. I don't know if you know that. I hope you participate in it. But every 10 years we do a census. And you should participate in it because it helps us to know where to build roads, where to build schools, hospitals, and send the resources. But we do it from the comfort of our home. A little card, you send it in. Or I think you can even do it online. But here, you have to go back to your ancestral town. Right? You have to go back from where your gente came from. Right? You have to go back to El Rancho. I think my family would go back to Falfurias. I don't know where we would go. Verse 4. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient, ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. Now, we spent several months studying the miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Mark. And I showed you how Jesus spent most of his time in, um, in Galilee. Right, and the, the majority of his miracles happened in, in Galilee. Jesus the Nazareth, Jesus from Na Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus from um, Nazareth. So we know where Jesus was from, but to fulfill prophecy, one, he came from the tribe of Judah, two, he's a descendant of David, three, 
He was born in Bethlehem. You remember last week we studied the wise men, and when the wise men showed up with King Herod, Herod asked the scribes, where is the king of the Jews supposed to be born? And they told him it's written in Bethlehem. And this is how Jesus ends up in being born in Bethlehem, though his family by this time had lived in Galilee. He's born in Bethlehem. Right? There's no coincidence. God working. Verse 5 says, he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Verse 6, and while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. So this is how the baby is born in Bethlehem and not in Nazareth. Verse 7 says, she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. I want you to notice this very first phrase, all right? She gave birth to her firstborn son, right? Why would it be pointed out that she gave birth to her firstborn son? Like, why would it use that term, firstborn son, as opposed to just saying she gave birth to her son? Because if there's a first, then there's what? There's more, right? There's more. And, and, and this is what, what, the, what the gospel is, is uh, uh, what Luke is alluding to, right? Um, and so she gave birth to her firstborn, and then they wrapped him snugly in these strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. They went, they went to a Holiday Inn Express. They went to La Quinta. They went to the Marriott. They went to all the hotels in Bethlehem. Let me tell you, Bethlehem's a little, little town. And because of the census, all these people showed up. And when they went to look for a room, my wife is pregnant. My wife is about to give birth. People were like, sorry, sorry, sorry. More than likely, more than likely, they were in, in a cave where they would keep sheep. They would keep animals because in Bethlehem, that's where um, they have flocks of sheep. And... Um, this, this, this means something, right, that, that, that he was snugly, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. I remember years ago, my, my dad was like, you know, this, this means something. Like, like there's a, a meaning behind this, right? The Bible doesn't just show us something just to show us something. And, um, well, I'll, I'll share something with you in a minute, but let's go to verse 8. It says, I'll, I'll get back to the, to the clause. It says, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. So remember, they're in Bethlehem, and in Bethlehem, there, there's a lot of, uh, that's where they prepare the sheep or the lambs that are going to be sacrificed in the Passover, all right? And so the shepherds are out there shepherding, and, and imagine in the middle of the night, like it's dark, and then all of a sudden, these angel, this angel appears, the glory of the Lord, the radiance and glory of the Lord appears. I mean, I'd, I'd be terrified myself. Verse 10 says, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Now notice this is good news that will bring great joy. Is it, is it Disney that they say it's the happiest place on earth? Is it, you know, Disney has that, that, that's like their slogan, it's the happiest place on earth. You, you know where, where the happiest place on earth should be? This should be the happiest place on earth. Why? Because this is where we proclaim. This is where we teach. This is where we preach good news. Right? The good news that will bring great joy. Right? So when we come to church, I mean, we should be happy. We should be excited. Uh, I, I know when I was a, 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 a kid, certain times in my life, especially when I was a teen, certain times in my life, going to church was like a chore. Going to church was like, oh, I don't know where I'm going to go. I mean, we had church like all the time. We had church like in the morning, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, Fridays, Saturday morning, Saturday night. All the kids, you know, they'd watch these shows Friday nights and Saturday nights. And um, then Monday, you know, and Sunday, they'd show up to school and talk about them like Knight Rider. I never got to see Knight Rider. One time I said this in church, back when Pueblo's church was first starting, I was like, man, I never got to see Knight Rider. Somebody bought me the whole collection of Knight Rider on DVD. I'm like, that's not why I say these things. I'm just sharing with you. I'll, I'll tell you all something true. Five years, ago, five years ago is when we stopped Sunday night service so we could add uh, Pueblo's at 12. That was the first time, five years ago, I'm, I'm 48 young, all right? 
Five years ago was the first time that I got to watch the Super Bowl live. Because we're always in church. We're always in church. So my brother-in-law, Renee, would record it. And my dad and I, after church, would go home, eat, and, and watch the Super Bowl pre-recorded. And of course, by that time, somebody at church had already ruined it for us, told us who'd won and was the score. My dad would be like, no me digan. You know, like my dad would get all mad. Or, you know, but the kids, you know, they don't know. And so anyway, so barely five years ago, it was the first time I ever saw a Super Bowl live, you know. And, um, but... You know what? Let me tell you that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when you and I are like pushing 90, pushing 100, and we're laying on that bed, somebody say amen, right? You're like that, okay. And we're laying on that bed about to say goodbye to our loved ones. It's not going to matter to you how many times you went to the club. It's not going to matter how many times, you, you know, you watched Knight Rider, <laughs> how many Super Bowls you watched and had fajitas. You know what's going to matter? How much time you spent in the presence of the Lord? Right? How much time you spent in the presence of the Lord? When you're about to be face to face with the Lord, you're going to want to know, you're going to want to be able to say, you're going to want to be able to be presented as someone who is good and faithful, right? Who spent time in the house of worship, worshiping the Almighty, right? And so this good news brings great joy to all people. And I was sharing this in the other services, you know, that some people have a problem with all people coming into church. Some people think that church should just be for like the good ones, the saved. But really, church, church is for the sick. Church is for, for, for the lost, right? I, I will say this publicly, right? Adulterers are welcome and loved at Pueblo's church. Right? LGBTQ plus are welcome and loved at Pueblo's church. Right? Thieves are welcome and loved at Pueblo's church. Don't rob us, but, you know, don't steal from us, but... You're welcome and loved at, at Pueblo's Church. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're, we're getting more and more homeless people and, um, and drug addicts and prostitutes in our area. And sometimes, you know, a homeless or a drug addict will come into service and people will come to me, Pastor, Pastor, there, there's a homeless guy in the church. I'm like, Gloria a Dios. There's a drug addict in church. Gloria, I mean, this is where we want them, right? This is where we want them, that they would receive the good news that there is a Savior. That there is someone who came to save us. That there is hope. And it's found in Jesus Christ. This is where we want them. Right? Amen or no? Amen. This was the weakest amen in all of the weekend, right? This is where we want the homeless. This is where we want the drug addicts. This is where we want the prostitutes. Amen, yes or no? Yeah, you are like, amen, amen. As long as they sit over there, right? <laughs> like, not on my bench. Like, all right, all right, let's move on. Okay. Verse 11, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Notice that this was like some type of sign, this being wrapped in these strips of cloth. And so I heard this rabbi teaching on this. And he says that in Bethlehem is where the lambs that they were going to use for the sacrifice in Passover, this is where, where they were raised. And when Passover started, the Lord told Moses, tell the people they're going to sacrifice a lamb, one year old, male, without defects, right? Without defects. Now, more than likely, Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus are in a cave, and caves are not smooth. Caves have ridges, they have points, they can be sharp. And when animals are first born, they're, they're dumb and clumsy, right? And so they can fall and hurt themselves. Uh, I remember years ago, we were working with a, um, uh, with a, a yearling, a young horse, a, a, a potrillo, and um, we were gonna take him to the vet to get checked out and to get um, uh, his, his vaccines. And man, this, this little horse was, you know, uh, a nervous, nervous nilly. I mean, like just, just like nervous, 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 like would shake and stuff. And so when they tried to get her, it was, it was actually a female horse. When they tried to, to get her, she took off running and she just, there was a fence and she just ran straight into that fence and bap, just like this huge gash on on the, and then so by the time the guys got her and, and took her to the vet like that, like everybody's all embarrassed because they're like, man, we hope that the vet doesn't think we're like abusing this animal or something, right? And the vet had to stitch, stitch it up. And, and the vet was like, I've never seen a horse this nervous in my life. 
if that would have been a lamb, automatically would not have been able to be used for Passover because it couldn't have any defect, right? Any defect. And so what the, this rabbi says is that sometimes lambs would um, be born and, and because they were clumsy or whatever, they would wrap them in cloths so that if they fell against the wall or pushed up against the wall, they wouldn't, they wouldn't cut themselves, they wouldn't injure themselves. But either way, this was a sign for the, for the shepherds. And you don't always think about this, like lay, lying in a manger, uh, you, you work with cows or sheep or whatever, the moment you start putting feed, Animals drool, right? I mean, they drool nasty. I mean, my dog, like the moment she hears me walking toward, you know, where I, I feed her, like she's already, <laughs> and she's just like drooling. I'm like, get up, get back, Mia, get back. And um, so you can imagine, I mean, the, the king of glory, leaving the throne of heaven to be laid in a manger. Verse 13, and suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, verse 14, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see these things that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried, like many of you heard to church this morning. <laughs> they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. Let's go back to verse um, 11. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. I want to talk about these three words, Savior, Messiah, and Lord. Savior. Jesus is the Savior. As a matter of fact, the name Jesus, that's what it means. It means Savior. Why would God send the Savior, right? Why would God send the Savior, who is the Messiah, who is the Lord? Why would he come to this world? Because you and I needed to be saved, right? You and I needed to be saved. Salvation was needed. Therefore, God sent the Savior. Right? And the Savior came to save that which was lost, Jesus said, I came to find and save that which was lost. And amongst that which was lost were you and I. And therefore the Savior came to save us. Amen. And oftentimes when we talk about salvation, people think about salvation as this moment in our lives. I share often about, about the age of 12 years old. We were in a church over on 225. And our Sunday school teacher talked to us about salvation and I gave my Lord to Jesus and I was saved. And, and you may have a similar story. Maybe you were in church and we talked about salvation and, and you gave your life to Jesus. Maybe someone one-on-one -on -one talked to you about Jesus and you gave your life to Jesus. Uh, and you, were, you were saved and oftentimes we think that that's what salvation is about. But let me tell you three things about salvation. One, we were saved Two, we are being saved. And three, we will be saved. Right? Past, present, and future. Right? That moment in time you were saved, that we call justification. You were justified by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But now you are being saved. There's a process that's happening in your life, and that is called sanctification. God is sanctifying you. Scripture says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on into perfection until the day of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God is working with you. Let me give you an example. Some of you, before you came to the Lord, before you put your faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, before you started coming to church, man, you used to cuss a lot, like a lot, like a hundred times per day. Right? Fast forward one year, serving the Lord, and now you curse only 25 times per day. Right? There, there, there's a change happening, right? There's a transformation. And, and in a year or two years, all, all of a sudden, like, like those words are no longer part of your vocabulary, right? Instead of cursing, you will be blessing. Instead of speaking death, you will be speaking life. Instead of destroying and tearing down, your words will lift up and edify. And before you know it, you who, who, who curse so much, 
In the past, people were going to say, man, your vocabulary has changed. Yeah, because the Lord is sanctifying you. I have a loved one in my life that before coming to, to the Lord, he drank. He drank. He even had a nickname, and his nickname was based on the fact that he drank so much. And his life has changed a lot, that he no longer reflects that person. Why? Because sanctification is happening. The Lord is working in his life. And there are certain things that happen in our lives that the Lord is changing in our lives. Some things happen immediate. Some things is a process. For some people, there's immediate radical change. For other people, there's a process that's occurring. If we look at the life of Saul of Tar Tarsus, Paul, he had an encounter with Jesus and immediately his life was radically changed. We look at Peter. Peter walked with Jesus. He was one of the original 12 disciples, 12 apostles. Yet we see at the end, he denies Jesus three times and then had to be restored. There was a process in the life of one and immediate change in the life of another. I don't know what God is working in your life, but you should be able to see, hey, things are changing in my life. Some things are changing rapidly. Some things are taking time, but the Lord is sanctifying me through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And then the last thing is that you will be glorified. One day we will close our eyes to this world and we will open our eyes in the presence of the Lord. And a few months ago, we saw that we will be presented with gladness before the Lord. We will be presented with great joy before the Lord. And that we call glorification. Sin won't be a part of our life. Temptation won't be a part of our life. Sin won't even be a thought in our life. Because our, 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 our lives will, will be so radically transformed that, that we will look like the Son of God, Jesus. Right? So there's, you were saved, you're being saved, you will be saved, you were justified, you're being sanctified, one day you will be glorified. Justification, sanctification, glorification. The next word I want you to look at, it says the Messiah. Right? Most of your Bibles, if you don't have a New Living Translation, says the Christ. We're about to celebrate Christmas, right? We get Christmas from the word Christ. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And so Christ is a Greek word. Messiah is a Hebrew word. And they mean the same thing. They mean anointed one. When we say Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the Christ, it means the same thing. But what we're saying is Jesus is the anointed one, right? The anointed one. This isn't just any savior. This is the anointed savior. In other words, this is the official savior of God. Others can pretend. Others can say, well, I'm the savior. I came to save. No, no, no. There's one official savior, right? His name is Jesus Christ. And so in the Old Testament, there were three types of people that were normally anointed. The prophets, they were anointed. And the prophets represent the word of God. And um, John starts off his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then... We have Moses, who's considered one of the great prophets. He says, one day, one like me from amongst you will come. In other words, Moses is saying, like, I'm pointing to someone else. He was pointing to Jesus, right? So the other group that was anointed were the priests, right? The priests, they were anointed. And there are priests, but then there is what we call the high priest. And Jesus is the high priest. In Spanish, we call him sumo sacerdote. Right? You graduate from the university, and vast majority of people graduate from the university with just normal, regular grades. And then some people graduate with honors. They call that cum laude. And then some people graduate with high honors. They call that summa cum laude. Right? I know some of y'all are asking, Pastor, how did you graduate? I graduate, praise the Lordy, a panzazos, but you know, C's get degrees, I got through it, right? You know. But summa, it means high, right? Jesus is our high priest, and the high priest is our leader in all spiritual matters. Yeah. I was on an airplane once, and um, there was this guy, and, he, and uh, 
I don't know how he, I, I think him and the flight attendant had like a mutual friend. So at a certain point she comes and she sits with him and they're talking. And then somehow they start talking about spiritual matters. So of course my ears are like, boop, 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 boop. you know, we're in a flight, you're talking loud. It's not my fault, I'm nosy, right? And, uh, and so he says, well, you know, like I don't really consider myself religious. I consider myself more spiritual. And, and she says, she goes, you know, she goes, me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like more spiritual. He goes, yeah, you know, and so I've been like on this spiritual journey, right? And she's like, yeah, yeah, like me too. Yeah, I believe that too. And he's like, you know, because I just want to grow spiritually. And she's like, yeah, 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 that's amazing. That's awesome, you know, like that. And um, when, anytime I hear someone say, I'm, I'm not religious, I'm more spiritual, I always like to ask, what does that mean? Well, you know, like spiritual. Okay, yeah, thank you. What does that mean? Well, you know, like, like I believe we're spirits. And just like, okay, what does that mean, right? I mean, you, you start peeling the onion, right? You start peeling the, that's not a very deep onion. I can tell you that much, you know. Anybody who's like spiritual, man, that onion is, 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 is flaky, you know. Like you just get to two or three layers and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're We're spiritual beings. C.S. Lewis says, uh, used to say that we are spirits with a body, not bodies with a spirit. Right? We're spiritual beings. We were created in God's image. This body is temporary. But one day, this body, we're going to do away with this body, and you'll end up in one of two places. Either you'll end up in destruction or you'll end up in heaven. It, I'll, put it, I'll put it straight up for you. You either end up in hell or you end up in heaven. Right? There's no in-between. And if you say, hey, I want to go to heaven. I want to make sure I end up in heaven. But there's only one way, one truth, and one life. And it is through the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, Jesus Christ is his name. And Jesus says, no man comes to the Father except through me. A religion cannot save you. A pastor cannot save you. A pope cannot save you. A saint can't save you. A virgin can't save you. Being spiritual can't save you. But Jesus Christ came to find and save that which was lost. Jesus came to save us. The priests were anointed. They represent the leaders in all spiritual matters. And the kings were anointed. And they represent the leaders in all earthly matters. Right? We live in this world, but we're not of this world. Tomorrow we go to school, tomorrow we go to work, we hang out con los compadres. But don't be out there acting a fool. Okay? You're a believer in Jesus Christ, your words, your walk, your talk, your actions, your reactions should reflect your believer in Jesus Christ. Okay? You're at work, and the men are talking about women in a certain way or cursing or whatever it is or they're lying, stealing, cheating or they're doing what with who knows who behind who's barn and nobody wants to clean it up. You need to remember you're a child of God. Okay? You're with your friends and they like to celebrate Christmas a certain way and they like to celebrate their kids' birthdays a certain way. And they like, you need to remember that you're light in the world. You're salt in the world. You're a child of God, and our life should reflect it. You're married, you need to remember, you're light in the world, you're salt in the world, and your life should reflect it. Right? And so, because we have a king, and one day we will have to answer to that king. As a matter of fact, one day the world will answer to that king. And the words I want to hear heard, the words I want to hear said, and the words you're going to want to hear is going to be, well done, good and faithful servant. So we believe in Jesus. Let us live our lives as if we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Prophet, priest, king. Speaking of king, the third word I want you to look at is the word Lord, the Lord. What does Lord mean? Lord means king. It means master. It means possessor. Colossians says that everything was created by him, for him. The world, the sun, the star, the moon, uh, the universe was created for, by him, for him. 
This world was created by him for him. You were created by him for him. Everything beautiful, everything that, that pertains to creation, anything ugly that's part of creation, somehow or another was created by him for him. Your boss that gets on your last nerves was created by him for him. Your wife that you're praying for to come to church. Your husband that you're struggling with every time you come to church and he doesn't want to come to you was created by him for him. And when you and I confessed Jesus as Lord, what we were saying is that from here on out, I'm surrendering everything in my life. I'm surrendering my resources. I'm re surrendering my, my feelings, my emotions, my body, uh, my marriage, my family, everything about me. I'm surrendering it to you. You are now the owner of my life and I'm your slave. That's what literally it means. But in God's mercy and God's grace, he doesn't treat you like a slave. He accepts you as a son and daughter. And the Bible says that we would be brothers to Jesus and Jesus first amongst us. Right? Man, how powerful these words, Savior, Messiah, Lord. When we talk about Jesus coming as the most vulnerable amongst us. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 8. And verse 8 says, That night... There were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified. Shepherds. Shepherds was kind of like the low of the lows. You're a horrible mechanic. You're, you're a horrible um, uh, carpenter. Horrible dishwasher. Horrible. I mean, everything is just kind of, okay, well, moving down. You know what? Put them and go take, take, take care of the sheep. Right? I mean, this was like the job that they gave to low skill. They gave it to either kids or to the elderly or people who were low skill. I mean, you know, think about it right now. now. You ask a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, I want to be a police officer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an engineer. 2023, I want to be a gamer. Yo se reprende ese espíritu. Nobody ever says, I want to be a shepherd. I want to smell like outside. I want to smell like dirty sheep. No, nobody ever says that. Nobody says that. You would think that the king of glory came to this world and you would think that, hey, last week we studied that the wise men came, the mad guy, these were dignitaries. That made sense to me. King Herod said, let me know where he's at. I want to go. Now, he didn't really want to go, but you know what I'm saying. But let's just say him showing up, that wouldn't make sense to me. Kings and queens and princes and princesses and, and ambassadors and, 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 and the who's who of, of Jerusalem, them showing up, all of that would have made sense to me. But God didn't choose any of them. God chose the lowest of the low. He chose shepherds. I'm going to remind you of Genesis and in Genesis, there's a young man by the name of Joseph and his brothers hate him. He's the youngest. He's his dad's favorite. His brothers hate him. He's one of the youngest. His dad's favorite. They end up selling him as a slave. He ends up in Egypt. In Egypt, he becomes the most powerful man in Egypt. Number one behind Pharaoh. And as a matter of fact, he was over Pharaoh because the Bible says he was like a father to Pharaoh. He advises Pharaoh on certain things and Egypt becomes perhaps the most powerful country in the world filled with riches and there's a tremendous drought and people have to show up to Egypt to buy food and somehow his brothers show up. They reconcile. He tells his brothers, come back, come over here. While I'm here, man, you, we guys, you guys have it made in the shade. And he's like, bring my dad, bring everybody. And when they came to Egypt, they didn't necessarily stay in Egypt. They stayed a little bit outside of Egypt because God's children, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And there's always a little bit of a separation between us and what's happening in the world. And so they stayed outside in the way they, you know, because I'm pretty sure the way Pharaoh saw it was Joseph, if your brothers are anything like you, man, we're going to dominate the world. Bring your family. But Joseph had another plan to keep his family innocent, to keep his family distinguished different than Egypt, apart from Egypt. Him and his brothers come and present themselves before Pharaoh. 
And when Pharaoh says, what, what do y'all do? You're doctors, you're engineers, you're lawyers, you're, you're, you're attorneys, what are y'all? They were like, we're shepherds. Oh, well, you guys can go over there. Because for the Egyptians, like being a shepherd, I mean, that's the lows of the low. Nobody wants to do that. And Pharaoh's like, yeah, you take care of my stuff, but take care of it over there. That's who God chose. We spent about three months studying all of the miracles of Jesus as presented in the Gospel of Mark. And we saw Jesus over and over deal with people who were rejected. The woman with the blood flow, she, it was not allowed for her to be amongst the people Yet Jesus received her. The lepers that Jesus healed, they couldn't be amongst the people. They couldn't, like, like it, was, it was an abomination. It was prohibited for them to be around people. Yet Jesus received them over and over. Jesus healed people that were blind, deaf, and mute. I mean, for the Jews, they thought that those people were cursed. There's a, there's a story in the Gospels where there's this man that was born blind, and the disciples come and ask Jesus, Teacher, who sinned? Him or his parents? Jesus is like, neither. Jesus received tax collectors. They, they were seen as sellouts because they were Jews who worked for the Romans and they were collecting the tax money and they would take a little extra extra for themselves. Jesus received a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery and instead of condemning her, he saved her. Jesus meets a woman at the well in Samaria the Jews hated the Samaritans, but Jesus said, it's necessary that I go to Samaria. And then he meets this woman that had had five husbands and she was living with the sixth dude. And Jesus still received her. Fast forward 2,000 years later, and Jesus received us. Right? Still receives the rejected still receives the outcast, still makes room for the rejected, still makes room for the outcast. Oftentimes I'll talk to people about the things of the Lord and many times people will say in Spanish, they'll say, me siento tan alejado, which means I feel so far away from the Lord. Let me tell you, the Lord will still receive you. I'm born and raised in the church, a very imperfect individual. I know what it's like to be out Friday night and Saturday night and then show up to church and feel like a hypocrite, raising my hands, singing and worshiping and opening my Bible. But Jesus still receives and forgives the sinners. I know what it's like to have circumstances in my life that are so difficult that the attorneys cannot do anything for you. The accountants cannot do anything for you. The doctors cannot do anything for you. But Jesus is still our and he still receives the lost. He still lifts up the fallen. He still strengthens the weak. He still heals the sick. And he still saves the lost. And that's why we're here this afternoon. Can somebody help with the name, man? Let's close our Bibles. Let's bow our heads. And I want to invite you to just start thanking God that you came to church today. We just simply start thanking the Lord you came to church. Say, thank you, Lord, I came to church. Thank you, Father, that we made it to church. If your family is here with you, will you thank the Lord that your family came? It's a tremendous blessing. Thank you, Lord, that my parents were here in the morning. My mom is here. Ronnie is here. My nieces, my wife, my sister. Thank you that Nelly and Jorge, the boys are here. Thank you that my in-laws were here earlier, Father. Will you thank the Lord because he is here Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you still dwell in the praises of your people. Jesus, we thank you so faithful to your word that when two or three are gathered in your name, you're there in the midst. Holy Spirit, we thank you, Holy Spirit. Because we know that you are here with us. You are over us, you are amongst us, you are in us. I don't know the condition that you find yourself in or the position you find yourself in. But maybe you feel like these shepherds. Man, I'm not a king, I'm not a queen. How do I present myself before the King of Kings, the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior? 
I'm not a religious person. I don't know much about the Bible. I don't even pray every day. How am I going to come to church and present myself before the Savior, before the Messiah, before the Lord? I, I feel like such a hypocrite. Jesus still receives the rejected. He received those shepherds. He'll receive you. He re received the adulterer. He'll receive you. He received that Samaritan woman. He'll receive you. But you, like the prodigal son, have to make the decision to come to him. God's not going to force you, but he presents before you an opportunity. That's what a gift is. Nobody can force a gift on you. You have to make the decision to receive it. The gift of salvation through Jesus Christ is presented before you. You have to make the decision to receive it. This afternoon, if there is anyone that says, you know what, I want Jesus in my life. Some of you might even say, I need more of Jesus in my life. In an act of faith, would you raise your hand and would you say, I need Jesus in my life. I see you on my left. I see you in the middle. God bless you. Up in the balcony, many hands in the balcony. On my right-hand side, God bless you. In the back, here in the middle, God bless you. You know what's more important than the pastor seeing you? is his eyes are on the sparrow. His eyes are on you. I want to invite everyone, let's confess our faith together. Will everyone repeat this prayer with me? Say, Father God, I thank you that I made it to church today. And I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart. Your son, Jesus Christ. He is the Savior the Messiah, the Lord. And I believe with all of my heart that he died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. He was buried, and three days later, you resurrected him. And because I confess and believe this, you promise me salvation. And with salvation, there are promises. Promises of a new life promises of abundant life and the promise of eternal life. And I receive it all in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise.